Welcome to Strange Things, broadcasting from the Remundo Rios Mayo Library in Arcanessa. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the show. Tonight, we're going to have a special guest, Mr. Nick Redfern. He's a writer, traveler, investigator, and journalist, not to mention Monster Hunter. He's been on Monster Quest, UFO Hunters, and Ancient Aliens. Born in 1964 in Pelsall, Walsall, Staffordshire, England, he's written or co-authored 72 books. Is that about right, sir? Oh, no, it's about 30-something. <laughs> well, co-authored. I guess that's the internet, though, for you. <laughs> well, yeah, it's roughly half that amount. Mm, I see. Well, I did <laughs> see your name on a lot of books that I was scanning through in... Uh, Amazon. Oh, well, I, yeah, actually, sometimes it gets a bit confusing because often what happens is Amazon will, if you go to some of the pages, um, you'll see my book listed as an author or co-author. When in actual fact, I've sort of written the forward or the introduction. I think there's actually about 15 books on Amazon that I've written the intro or the forward for. But at one point, sort of more than half of those had me listed as like co-author. So, it, you know, it does get a little bit confusing. Oh, yes. Uh, how do you like living here in Texas now? Oh, I like it. I've been here about um, 16 years, something like that. Hmm. Do um, they? Yeah, I, I lived um, down by Houston for all, about the first four years I was here. A mm. uh, little uh, town called um, Needleland, just outside Beaumont. And um, then for the last 12 years, I've lived um, in the Dallas area. When you go back to England, do people tell you you have an odd accent? <laughs> Um, they don't sort of say an odd one. They just say, kind of say that um, that it sounds slightly different. It still sounds English, I think, but it sounds um, not my original accent. So. <laughs> uh, how did you... Which I guess after 16 years, you know, it would change. Oh, yes. <laughs> how did you get started writing? Oh, well, um, when I finished school, um, I just... Is it one of the sort of those lucky occasions, you know, that sometimes happens... Um, I wasn't the best student at school, um, you know, I was, uh, to, to put that diplomatically and mildly, <laughs> I was not good at school, um, and I didn't sort of get much in the way of academic qualifications, no college, no university, and short, to cut a short story, uh, long story short, I walked out of school one day and never went back, <laughs> and, um, and I didn't know what I was going to do, and it just so happened that the local town I was living in at the time... Um, <clears throat> When I was looking for work, there was an advertisement for a, a magazine starting up in the area that I was living called Zero. And it was going to be sort of like a, a typical sort of city what's on guide, you know, as to everything that's going on, restaurants and um, bands and clubs and cinema, all that kind of thing in the area for the week ahead or the two weeks ahead. Um, and they were looking for people straight out of school who would be sort of taught the basics from the bottom upwards. And... I thought, well, that kind of sounds cool, and um, I went along, and, um, you know, I've always enjoyed reading and writing, as I said, even though I wasn't particularly good at school. Um, and they said, well, you know, if you, if you like books and reading and whatever, you know, we'll, uh, we'll take a chance on you. And so they taught me basic journalism from, you know, the ground up, and I did that for a couple of years, and that sort of gave, gave me a background in writing and journalism, and then I just decided to go freelance and approached you know magazines and um newspapers that kind of thing and um and then sort of went full-time writing when i was about in my uh, early 30s something like that that is amazing so you had no formal journalism training whatsoever i had no formal educational oh. background either never mind just in journalism <laughs> oh. i um you know for, for me and my uh mates at school you know school was just for mm -hmm. having a good time you know <laughs> and, um, but you know look with hindsight looking back you know I mean it's always good to have a, an academic background but uh, 
it wasn't for, you know, um, yes. I, I wasn't lazy. You know, I just, you know, I just wasn't interested in algebra or the rainfall level in Guyana or somewhere. You know, what good was it going to do me after school? Yes, I know what you it's mean. It's not. So, you know, I was more interested in, you know, the sort of things that I'd actually need to know when I left school, you know, sort of um, just the day-to-day -day things of, of, of living a life, you know. Um, so, yeah, I mean, but in England, they used to, back then, well, they still have a version of it today. They're what was called the Youth Opportunities Programme. What it was was where companies would be paid 50% of the income by the government of the like the teenage boy or girl they were going to employ. So in other words, the job that I got, the government paid 50% of my weekly income wow. and the company only had to pay 50% of it. And they got other benefits as well to train people, uh, you know, straight out of school in one particular profession. So it actually benefited the company to do it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and it was quite a successful program. That was sort of what I went on. But no, I had no sort of formal you know, journalism degree or anything like that at all. It was just a case of, we'll take a chance on you and we'll teach you all how to be, how to be a journalist and to write and everything else. And that's what happened, really. Well, you've done quite successful at it. How many different, well, thank you. How many different countries have you gone to on your endeavors of investigating different things? Um, well, quite a few. I mean, you know, obviously living in the UK, I mean, traveling around Europe is easy. So, you know, I did a lot in in various countries in Europe, like um, Switzerland, um, France, um, Holland, um, and of course in the UK, Scotland, Ireland and Wales, and, and in England. Um, but also, I've uh, done investigation in Canada, obviously the US, uh, Mexico, uh, Puerto Rico, Jamaica, a few other places. Um, so, yeah, it's quite a few, you know, anywhere where there's sort of a something that interests me that I can sort of you know, investigate and sort of hopefully try and figure out what's going on. So. In your latest book, The Men in Black, you say you first became interested in the uh, Men in Black when you were about 11? Yeah, well, what happened was um, I got interested in the UFO subject round about that age, not because I'd had a personal encounter, but because my dad was in the British Royal Air Force. He worked as a, a radar mechanic, um, and he was involved in several... UFO incidents in the 50s where um, the radar operators over the course of three nights trapped these weird objects approaching the British coastline um, from the vicinity of Scandinavia. And because it was still the height of the Cold War, the first thought was, well, it's got to be the Russians, even mm -hmm. though these objects were performing all sorts of weird maneuvers. And um, as I said, it went on for three nights and planes were, jet fighters were scrambled to intercept them. Pilots couldn't get close to them. Some of them reported seeing disc-like objects. Others reported sort of blinding white lights, but which seemed to be under intelligent control. And my dad, as, the, as a radar mechanic, was brought in to make sure the radar equipment wasn't sort of making or interpreting false readings. Mm -hmm. And when it came clear that, you know, something was flying around, everybody was told, you know, you won't talk about this. And, and my dad didn't say anything until years later, um, when um, when I was about 12 or 13, 11, 12, something like that anyway. And he told me the story, and that's what got me interested. And then I started, as you said, around about 11, thereabouts, reading books. Um, I think one of the first, well, I know one of the first books I read was John Keel's The Mothman Prophecies, which contains quite a bit of Men in Black material. And... Um, uh, J. Allen Hynek's early books and, you know, a lot of the books from the 50s like Kehoe, um, which, you know, I was able to sort of, you know, by the time I was into this subject, that was like 25, almost 30 years later, uh, sort of the early 80s. And um, so at that point, you know, I was able to buy a, up a ton of cheap old sort of 50s paperbacks and whatever. And um, But I've always found the Many Black Mystery fascinating because, you know, unlike the movie versions, which everybody knows about Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones, the real men in black are sort of like ultra creepy and weird. They're nothing like, you know, they're not from the government. Um, you know, they're sort of five feet tall, pale, skinny, bulging eyes that they hide behind these big sunglasses. And they almost look like, as some people believe, like an alien-human hybrid. 
Wow. Uh, we're going to take a real quick break here just for a couple of minutes, run some commercials, and we'll be right back with Nick Redfern in just a moment. You're listening to Arkanasa Radio. Do you have skin? Would you like to take better care of it? Call Lourdes James, independent beauty consultant, and set up an appointment. Call 723-3019. If your vision isn't what it used to be, and you're not sure you're seeing Bigfoot or just your neighbor mowing his lawn, stop on by Del Norte Optical, 107 Calle Del Norte just across the street from the Embassy Suites. You should be able to see what you're looking at. If you're looking for a good cup of coffee, remember, the Organic Man Coffee Shop will soon be opening at their new location, 1002 Eater Bide, Suite Number 7. Life is too short to drink bad coffee. No, don't say goodbye. Stay with us. This is... Arcanelza Radio. Quédate con nosotros, estás escuchando Arcanelza Radio. You're listening to Strange Things with Chris James. And we're back. We're speaking with Nick Redfern, the author of Men in Black. Tell me, Nick, uh, do you think, why do you think Bender changed his direction suddenly from looking into men in black to looking into composers? <laughs> well, that's a good point. Um, <clears throat> Albert Bender was the guy who sort of really kicked off the entire men in black mystery in the early 50s. He lived in Bridgeport, Connecticut, and um, he lived in this old house that kind of looked like Norman Bates' his mom's house in Psycho, <laughs> you know, like some creepy old house. And of all places possible, he lived in the attic. And um, Bender was someone who, like a lot of sort of young people in the late 40s, early 50s, got really interested in the UFO subject, which really kind of kicked off in 47. And in 51, Bender created this group called the International Flying Saucer Bureau, the IFSB, and put out a newsletter, which he would sort of type and you know, from his, from his attic room and have copies made and, and mail it out all across the world. He actually got a lot of uh, interesting coverage and he was selling it, you know, by the thousands, literally. And um, this went on for a couple of years to the point where, you know, everything was going well. And then suddenly he closed down the IFSB and quit the subject completely and um, went on to run the Max Steiner uh, Appreciation Society, Max Stein, who did the uh, musical score for many movies, including the original King Kong. And um, and he just walked away from ufology, and uh, he, he confided in a good friend of his, Gray Barker, who wrote a number of UFO books over the years. Um, he confided in Barker that these three guys in black had visited him or threatened him and warned him. And, but he didn't say much more than that. And Barker wrote a book about it called... Um, they knew too much about flying saucers in 56. Now, because Barker hadn't been told much by Keel, he assumed that the men in black were from the government, and so he presented them in that book in that fashion. Mm -hmm. But after that, Bender decided to come out of semi-retirement, if you like, or complete retirement for a while to write a book called Flying Saucers and the Three Men, which was published in 62. And in that book... Uh, Bender's own book, he'd said, no, they weren't like government people. He said they, he would be in his attic room and he would feel sick and lightheaded and the room would be overwhelmed by this odour of like brimstone or sulphur. And these shadowy figures, almost like the, the shadow people that people talk about today, um, kind of manifested in the room and it was almost like a, a psychic, um, telepathic warning or threat, if you like, in his mind. And um, this went on and on for weeks, and he, he, both his physical and psychological health suffered. And he was basically a case of enough's enough. But a lot of people don't realize that Bender was heavily into the world of the occult. 
and in his you know, of course it depends if people believe in this kind of stuff or not, but he constructed what he called a paranormal altar to try and summon up supernatural entities in his bedroom. Yikes. And maybe that succeeded because he literally had these shadowy fedora-wearing black figures appear in his attic. And, and as I said, his health suffered. He got in a panic and totally freaked out and, and quit the whole subject. And after just coming back in 62... Um, that was his only sort of return to the subject, and he stayed away from it till '62, until his death uh, just two months ago. Man, that doesn't sound like a very uh, pleasant way to spend your time. So <laughs> no, and the problem is, like a lot of people who sometimes find themselves plunged into that state, he became very obsessed by it, and he had no life outside of it. And um, you know, and I always tell people when you're dealing with subjects like these, it's vital to you know have a retain um, hmm. not just a foothold but a significant portion of your life in the regular world as well but for bender everything revolved around the men in black and you know this sort of negative thing that got its grips into him and i think that probably had a, a bearing on it you know there's only sort of so much of that kind of stuff you can take i'm sure yes you've written several other books about the men in black you had covert agenda on the trail of the saucer spies, and then the real men in black, not to confuse with the current book that you've got. What is the difference between the real men in black and your current book? Well, the real men in black is sort of um, like a historical look at the subject, right from the very early years, years of Bender to the present day. So, in other words, it sort of focuses on, as I said, the history of it and the different theories for who or what the men in black might be. And so it covers everything from classic cases, um, new and un un previously unseen cases, and theories that range from sort of government agents, demonic entities, time travellers, alien-human hybrids. There's sort of chapters on all the different theories. Um, but where's the new book, Men in Black? That is basically a collection of all the stories that have reached me since the real Men in Black book came out. You know, it's like if you're an author on any aspect of the paranormal, people tend to write to you if they've had their experiences in that field. You know, so if somebody's an expert in, I know, Area, 50, <clears throat> Area 51, people who write books on it, I'm sure they get a ton of mm. letters and emails from people who, you know, worked there or knew something about it. And it's kind of like that with the Men in Black. You know, I get a lot of emails and Facebook messages from people who've, read the earlier books I did, and want to share their stories. So the new book, Men in Black, um, which subtitled Personal Stories and Eerie Adventures, is a, like a, an extensive, about 300-page collection of all the cases that have come in since, as I said, the real Men in Black came out. Um, and there's about, I think, 40 or so personal reports and stories from people uh, giving their opinions on um, the men in black. And me, I introduce each person and, you know, provide a commentary about them and an introduction as well. Um, so it's sort of, you know, like a, letting the, the witnesses um, present their stories in their own words. Hmm. In the, the book, you're talking about Brad Steiger. He is also a UFO investigator. Where he was, he I believe he said he picked up the telephone and he could hear two people talking back and forth? Yeah, actually, Brad had more than a few encounters and run-ins with Men in Black characters over the years. Uh, <clears throat> for example, strange phone calls, um, Men in Black type characters who almost seemed to be mimicking him, you know, almost like doppelgangers. People saw, thought they saw him in places where he actually wasn't. And that, sort of got, that got really creepy and... Um, Friends of his got followed. One guy, classic story that he told me, which I included in The Real Men in Black, how a friend of Brad's was visiting London for a, a few weeks or a couple of weeks um, in the mid-60s, and he got followed by this sort of trio of these weird, skinny men in black, and they looked sort of just... They didn't actually sort of look properly human. Um, and one of them sort of said, came up to him at one point and said, you're a friend of Brad Steiger, he sort of said it more of a statement than a question. And the guy was sort of felt very intimidated and said, well, yes. And the one said, tell him we will visit him at Christmas time. And then they just turned and wandered off into the darkness. 
So it was a very sinister kind of story, and Brad's got a lot of accounts like that where it's sort of a perfect example of when you go looking for the men in black as a researcher, you know, sometimes, somehow, they know about it, and then they turn the tables on you. Mm. He also mentioned where he was supposed to have had a debate with Carl Sagan that he had never participated in. Yeah, that's one of the perfect examples of where, you know, I mentioned about how Brad almost seems to have had this sort of man in black style doppelganger uh, mimicking him. And um, Brad told me how, you know, he'd spoken to people who swore they saw Brad and Sagan having this debate. And, and it actually did not happen. It's not the case that Brad forgot about it. It, didn't, it simply didn't happen. Um, so that, that gets very weird. But that's not the first time things like that have happened. John Keel, when he was investigating the Mothman and Men in Black sightings in Point Pleasant in the 60s, um, he talked about how people would get phone calls and it sounded just like John Keel on the phone. Hmm. And then it turned out afterwards, you know, the person was who they assumed was Keel was asking for information and because they knew who he was, they were sharing it. And then it turns out that Keel had never, when he did meet the people, you know, when he actually went to town to interview the witnesses, they were like, well, we've already told you the story. And then he realized this was a pattern that was being repeated, that somebody had been able to mimic his voice and his character and everything to the point where people really thought they were speaking with Keel and, and it, it wasn't him. That could definitely mess up your life if someone oh, is yeah. going around pretending to be you, especially if you're a public figure. Well, you know, I think that's one of the reasons why people like Bender suffered so badly, because they get plunged into sort of such states of paranoia. Mm. And I think that's one of the things, more than any other with the Men in Black mystery, that the Men in Black are extremely good at doing, and that's plunging people into states of paranoia. You know, um, Bender found himself frightened to go out at night. You know, he was a big fan of going to the cinema on a weekend. And a couple of times he said he saw these shadowy men in the old streets of uh, Bridgeport sort of following him, you know, and they would sometimes look shadowy and insubstantial and other times more of like a physical form, but they would follow him and intimidate him and to the point where he got frightened to go out and then he developed bad stomach issues, which, kind of, although he didn't explicitly mention it, kind of sounds like, you know, he developed an ulcer through all this um, and he also developed, by his own admission, although it wasn't called that, back then he developed what was clearly obsessive compulsive disorder um because a couple of times he would go out and he'd come back to his to home and he'd find things had been subtly moved in his office and um this sort of plunged him into even more paranoia and because he it stressed him out so much he he got into a point where you know we realized like a pen had been moved or a notepad so he would put them back where they were and because his stress levels increased he kind of inadvertently developed obsessive compulsive disorder by having a place for everything, specifically because he wanted to see how easy it was to tell if something had been moved. But but the byproduct was that, as I said, he developed OCD and mm. he did get out over all this eventually, but um, not without you know without getting out the subject and sort of moving on to to other things. Was it Davis Weatherly who tried to make the connection between the black eyed children? and the mm. men in black. Oh, yeah, well, well, actually, there's there's quite a big connection, uh, or parallels, I should say. David wrote a paper for my a Men in Black book on this, all about the, the men in, excuse me, the black-eyed children angle. Now, the black-eyed children is sort of relatively, fairly relatively new phenomenon. Now, it only sort of start, started to surface within the last decade, but a few people have come forward to say, in the light of all the publicity, that they had the similar experiences decades ago, but, you know, to what extent we're not sure because those people didn't come forward until, you know, the sort of more of the, the modern era, so to speak. But the, the big parallels are, like the men in black, the, the black-eyed children dress in black almost exclusively. And whereas the men in black wear like a black fedora, the black-eyed children wear a black hoodie. So, you know, you've got the hat components as well. And both groups have very pale skin. But most significant of all, I guess, or equally significant, if you put all the aspects together, 
is the fact that they typically turn up at people's homes late at night and knock on the door and come up with excuses to try and get in the house. You know, we're lost, we, we've lost our parents, we don't know where we are, or we're hungry and we're homeless, can we come in? The whole point is always, can we come in the house? But they have to be invited in, which kind of ties in with like the old vampire legends. And it's kind of the same with the men in black. You know, they, they don't, as some people might imagine, try and force their way into the home. They try and wait, or they do wait for the people to invite them in. Or in some cases, the people felt almost if they'd been hypnotized into inviting them in. So you do have sort of four or five significant parallels there between the black-eyed children and the men in black. I see you were listed as a co-author on uh, David Weatherly's book also. I tried buying a copy, but right now it's going for $169.95 at Amazon. Well... And I'm a, yeah. Well, actually, I didn't. That's the perfect example of what I mentioned at the beginning. I didn't co-write it. Mm. I wrote the uh, foreword for it. Well, and that's one of the other issues where it causes a yes. a big confusion for a lot of people because it's clearly, you know, if you read the book or if you open the Kindle version, you know, you you can see my name is just listed on the book mm. as the, the, doing the introduction or the foreword. But and I don't understand why, you know, that happens. But if it's going for that much on Amazon, that's not what David sells. You can get it direct from David at his own website. Um, but unfortunately, what happens is that people who've got their own copies and they know what it sells for, you know, they'll just put them on Amazon at ridiculous at ridiculous prices because they've got an Amazon account to sell books, you know. And um, and unfortunately, the person who suffers is, is the reader um, because okay. people just quite rightly shouldn't have to pay that much for anybody's book you know that the author um, also cause but, uh, but david's website i think i think it's called two crows paranormal um if you google that i think you can you can buy it direct from david himself john kirk's book has got to have set some kind of a record though when it comes to extraordinary prices i looked it up just two days ago, they're still asking one thousand three hundred sixteen dollars and sixteen cents for his paperback. I showed Is that it. For his, yes, his the, Lake Monsters book. Yes, the Discovering the Cadborosaurus. I showed it to him on the uh, internet, wow. and he jumped up and ran around the room like, "Holy cow! I wish I could sell it for that." Ironically, ironically, um, I actually picked up a copy of that, uh, my my own copy mm -hmm. in. Um, a half price books uh, shop here in Dallas um, some time ago for like about five dollars or something like that. So. I paid twelve for mine, so yeah, it's it's funny. Yeah, again, they... you shouldn't have to pay that sort of price, you know, on Amazon. <laughs> well, they said they can't understand why they haven't sold any copies yet. It's like, well, maybe it's the price. <laughs> Getting yeah, back... maybe that's got something to do yeah. with it. <laughs> Getting back to the black eyed kids, I saw an interview with a man who claimed he created the whole thing while sitting in jail. But his story was that he had been interviewed by an author, and he just told him this story about the BEKs as a joke. The last time I checked, they don't allow people into jail just to interview suspects in there. But the guy no, did... I mean the important thing to note is with the let's like, start with the many black stories. Um, most of the people who have had MIB, excuse me, the uh, black eyed children experiences, have actually spoken on the record. I mean, the first guy who publicly spoke out was, a, was actually here in Texas, a mm -hmm. journalist. Um, I forget his name now, but, um, you know, you can find his name quite widely. And um, he really kicked the whole thing off. And um, he was a well-respected journalist in a, in a Texas town. Um, so it actually began here, you know, right here in the Lone Star State. Um, but as I said, most of the uh, witnesses have spoken out. And, and that's the case in a lot of the... You know, the ones David spoke about in his book, or excuse me, wrote about in his book, you know, that we're dealing, we're not dealing with Mr. X types or, you know, John Doe's or anything like that. These are people who anyone can track down by their name and an interview for themselves, you know. Yes. Well, there's always somebody out there who's willing to try and lay the claim for other people's work, it seems. Uh, well, that always goes on, you know, somebody wants to be the first with the most or whatever, and... Um, but that, that's, you know, I don't think that's got so much to do always with ufology or anything like that. I think that's just sort of human nature. You know, somebody wants to take credit for inventing this or, 
writing that song, you know, and there's plagiarism. Well, we wrote it before you do, you know, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. So. Well, let's take a real quick break here, uh, two minutes, and we'll be right back with Nick Redfern okay. after these messages. You're listening to Strange Things with Chris James. Do you have skin? Would you like to take better care of it? Call Lourdes James, independent beauty consultant, and set up an appointment. Call 723-3019. If your vision isn't what it used to be, and you're not sure you're seeing Bigfoot or just your neighbor mowing his lawn, stop on by Del Norte Optical, 107 Calle Del Norte, just across the street from the Embassy Suites. You should be able to see what you're looking at. No, don't say goodbye. Stay with us. This is Arcanelza Radio. Quédate con nosotros, estás escuchando Arcanaza Radio. You're listening to Strange Things with Chris James. And welcome back. We're speaking with Nick Redfern, author of The Men in Black. I saw a chapter that said there was a incident in 1977 at a Winchell's restaurant in Sunnyvale, California, where two teenage girls received a bizarre palm reading from someone. Could you expand on that a bit? Oh, yeah, that was a very weird story about um, this guy who, um, like a lot of the men in black, as I said, they're, they're not like the movie versions, you know, Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones. And this one was sort of classic example. It was, it was this creepy, old, skinny, cadaverous-type guy in the black suit and the fedora driving the black car. And for some reason, they seem to target people specifically, but, you know, not who they know. Very often, they'll sort of just approach people and make sort of a threatening statement or, you know, sort of just chill them to the bone. And that's what this guy basically did. He essentially sort of um, did a like a, a fortune-telling situation. And the uh, the woman I interviewed for the uh, book said, you know, he told her that she was going to suffer nothing but bad luck and ill health, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and... Um, which is exactly what happened, you know, just misfortune. And um, and it was a very creepy story that um, she never sort of forgotten, didn't feel that this was sort of a normal human being. There was something very evil about it, you know. It didn't even come across as a, as a regular person. It was, you know, just very, very strange, almost like something straight out of, you know, Edgar Allan Poe meets H.P. Lovecraft rather than The X-Files meets Independence Day, as you, as you might imagine. And that's the case with a lot of these stories that um, they seem to have, although they're tied to the men in, excuse me, to the UFO mystery, the men in black very much often come across as something definitively, like I said, supernatural occult um, that, you know, have far more in line with, with sort of a, a classic gothic horror story than, um, than, than you would imagine, you know, in today's world. How about the Hat Man connection with the MIBs? Well, yeah, I mean, that's a good uh, uh, sort of question because when we look at these stories, um, we find a lot of parallels. Now, I mentioned about Albert Bender, how a lot of his experiences began with this sort of shadowy experience, you know, where these shadows would appear in the room and then they would sort of take on substance. Um, that actually sounds very much like the phenomenon today, which, as you mentioned, you know, is, has become known as the shadow people. And they're sort of these shadowy figures that manifest very often in people's bedrooms in the middle of the night, and the person wakes up very often with a sense of paralysis to see this shadowy silhouetted figure standing over them at the side of the bed. And, you know, they're unable to move. Um, and very often it's wearing a fedora or, a, you know, an old-style hat, at least. And there's so many of these reports from not just the U.S., but all across the planet. 
Um, and rather bizarrely, this is where it gets really weird, um, I happen to know the guy who grew up in the house that I grew up in as a little kid, and he had one of these experiences, which was sort of really strange. Um, and so, you know, the, the shadow people actually sound very much like some of the men in black, and particularly with the fedora angle. And there's also like a sub-aspect of the shadow people, a character known as the hat man. And a good friend of mine, Heidi Hollis, um, Heidi, she wrote a book titled The Hat Man, which I'd recommend to anyone who might have had these experiences with these silhouetted shadowy beings in the night. And um, because it covers uh, literally hundreds of cases and all the various theories that have been put forward to explain The Hat Man. And I think it also ties in, I mean, I've got another book coming out in, in uh, July called Women in Black. Or the, the, the Kindle's actually already out, but the uh, paperback's out in July. And um, that covers the lesser known aspect of the women in black, which are very similar to the men in black. Then, of course, as we said, we've got the black eyed children. So I think you put all these together, black eyed children, men in black, women in black, shadow people, the hat man. The shadow people, you know, the shadow women even. Mm -hmm. And I think you put all this together and we're seeing sort of similar aspects of one larger phenomenon. Maybe one that sort of manifests in different ways to different people, but they all have sort of a common denominator to them, I think. You mentioned sleep paralysis. Do you think that's a real thing or just a made up medical term that people try to use to explain away a scary situation? Oh, well, I mean, there's no doubt that the phenomenon of sleep paralysis exists. For people who are wondering what it is or may be interested if they don't know, it's basically a case where people typically wake up at night <coughs> after they've gone to bed. And more often than not, most of the occurrences take place between about 1.30 and 3 a.m. The reasons we don't know, but that is when we're sort of in our deepest sleep state. So that probably has something to do with it, at least. You actually don't get that many reports sort of pre-midnight, and there are very few reports sort of 4 to 5 a.m. onwards. It's, it, as I said, it's always sort of 1.30 to 3, 3.30 thereabouts. And people wake up, or well, they're in a sort of semi-dazed, half-awake state, and they can't move, or they can only semi-move their muscles or their fingers or their hands. And they're in this state of paralysis, and they're also in this state of deep fear because they have this constant feeling that there's something dangerous and malevolent either in the room or moving towards the bedroom preparing to come inside and so they're fighting this paralysis now so there's no doubt that the phenomenon ex exists the big question is whether it's provoked by internal psychological issues involving the brain or is it prompted by an external phenomenon that perhaps even kind of attacks us when we're in our sleep state. And my personal view is that it's the latter. And the reason I say that is because I've got a lot of cases where people have had these experiences, the sleep paralysis, and they haven't always been alone, that somebody else has caught a glimpse of them, um, you know, who happened to wake up, but the person who was targeted couldn't get out of this par paralyzed state, but other people saw them. Um, there are examples, for example, uh, where people have seen the sort of the shadow person or the man in black, however you want to uh, describe them, not just in the sleep state. You know, they might have had this uh, paralyzed sleep state one night uh, thinking it was a dream, and then three days later as they're driving to work, they see this sort of grinning very often, sort of ghoulish-looking man in black staring at them from the side of the road, which seemingly no one else can see. Um, so, in other words there is a clear, a clear component in a lot of these cases where the person doesn't just experience it in the sleep state. And that, to me, that's a sort of an important factor when we're looking into this angle of is it all internal or is it external? Hmm. In the uh, Pennsylvania case, where there were three girls having a sleepover and a small triangular spaceship of some kind came to the window now this was before this overproduction of drones were flying about is that true yeah that's right and um yeah i mean i've got a lot of cases like that where um, you know <clears throat> sleepovers and you know sort of in the early hours of the morning and 
I think I mean I think I've got four cases in the book. <coughs> Excuse me. I think I've got four cases in the book where they're almost identical cases under very sort of you know parallel um, situations. Dead of night, very often young girls, and sort of predatory character in black. And um, and again, I think it comes down to the the likelihood. And and um, Heidi talks about this in her Hatman book that when we're in a sleep state, we're very vulnerable. And so, in other words, that, that vulnerability actually perhaps plays into the hands of whatever these entities are and whatever it is they want or need from us. Um, some people have suggested they sort of feed on, like, psychic energy, sort of high states of emotion. In other words, they terrorize us and terrify us to then essentially sort of feed on that, you know, the stress chemicals and adrenaline almost, like like a psychic vampire. Uh, <clears throat> but so many of them involve young girls in the dead of night that there has to be, as far as I'm concerned, some sort of connection here. And as I said, I don't think it's all bad dreams in the slightest. You know, we can go back through time uh, when, you know, these things were called incubus and succubus hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Um in Newfoundland, for example, they have a story of the old hag um, where this form manifests, as the title suggests, in the form of an old hag. But the the situation is basically the same. The person's terrified, they're not able to move, and they see this old hag sort of hovering in the doorway or sort of gliding towards the bed. Well, they said that they hadn't told anyone that they had seen this thing, and yet the men in black were able to show up Two weeks later, how do you suppose the MIBs knew to show up at that house? Well, I wish I had the answer um, to that one, Chris. But the, the problem is that the men in black, you're quite right, they have this sort of uncanny and eerie knack of being able to know when somebody has seen something, even when they haven't told it, you know, family members or the press or a local UFO group. You know, Nobody knows about it. And yet they still get sort of the late night slow knock on the front door and the threat. Um, there's no real way to have the answer to that. But there are a lot of cases where people have looked into a lot of these weird phenomena, like the Men in Black and Mothman, which you know is connected to the Men in Black mystery. And it's kind of almost as if when you start looking at the phenomenon, it's as almost as if somehow like the phenomenon knows about it. You know, it's almost like it gets tipped off like a kind of radar or sixth sense. And John Keel um, sort of, I guess, summed it up most appropriate of all. He said that when you notice these things, they notice that you notice them. And they kind of turn the tables on you. And I think somehow that ties in with the cases where people have been visited, but they've not told anyone. You know, it's, it's almost as if they've got some sort of a unique linkage to the person from the minute that the person sees the ufo or the you know the weird creature or whatever well, micah hanks the radio personality uh, he runs the graylian report he had yeah. a story where he said that someone he knew was told that they have to stop communicating with micah oh. did uh, that person ever speak to micah hanks after that well, yes, but I think it was in the context of sort of staying away from all of this. What happened was that Micah, like me, he's got a, you know an interest in a lot of different things, and one of them being the Men in Black. And um, he had this experience where this uh, again sort of creepy MIB um, approached uh, this um, colleague and friend of Micah and said, "You know, you'll you won't talk to Micah Hanks anymore." And this guy was sort of chilled to the bone by it, and finally confided in Micah and um, and it kind of freaked Micah out a little bit as well you know that that somebody was taking an interest in him and was warning other people to stay away from Micah you know and, and again you can understand how and why this does create paranoia and concern in some people's minds you know mm -hmm. it's just like well what's going on and who are they and um, Micah you know was absolutely sure that whoever this you know, man in black was that it wasn't sort of a prank. You know, um, uh, Micah's friend was was sort of deeply concerned and worried by this for for everybody's sakes, and um, you know, and that and that rubbed off on Micah as well. I can imagine.
Oh, John Keel accused uh, Gray Baker of writing some of his research letters himself, almost as if he was uh, faking his stories. Why is it, do you suppose, that so many people, not just the UFO community, but Bigfoot, ghosts, all these others, why do they go after each other so darn much? Well, you know, the, unfortunately, there's a lot of, you know, petty jealousy and stupidity in these subjects. You know, there's a great, don't get me wrong, there's a great deal of dedicated down-to-earth people. But it's like in many aspects of life, you know, petty jealousies and personality clashes come in and somebody doesn't like the fact that somebody's written a book on the subject before they would, theirs came out and they were planning theirs. You know, it's it's just a lot of it comes down to sort of egos and um, and sort of personal agendas. But you get that so much in ufology. You know, I don't really have any time for it because the way I look at it is that you know we're all. I've, I kind of take the view we're all in it together. Like you've got your your radio show, Chris. I write mm -hmm. books. Somebody else does, you know, a blog. Um, somebody else lectures. They've got their own TV show. And then we've got the witnesses who are, you know, the most important people of all. Because without the witnesses, we've got nothing to go on. And my view is that what we need to do is just pull together more and share information and get it all out for people to see. And don't sit around complaining and moaning because you were going to do a Loch Ness book and somebody beat you to it by three months. Well, big deal, mm -hmm. you know. But you're a grown-up, you know, you're an adult. Live with it and put your book out as well and... You know, it it adds to what we know, and it, just because somebody else puts a book out on Loch Ness doesn't mean yours isn't going to sell. You know, if people are interested in the Loch Ness monster, they're going to buy both books. So it's like just chill out, you know. Oh, yeah. um, so that's that's what it comes down to. You know, Keel Keel and Barker did have um, a clash, and again, one of the reasons was because Keel planned to write the Mothman prophecies, and. Um, Barker wrote his own book on Mothman called The Silver Bridge, which was a reference to this, the Silver Bridge in Point Pleasant, which collapsed, killing dozens of people at the height of the Mothman encounters, and which many researchers felt was connected to the presence of Mothman. So basically, Keel, who, you know, I have, a, I have a great deal of respect for Keel, and I love his books, but I think he just didn't like the fact that Barker was putting his own book out, and there would be another rival book on Mothman, you know. Hmm. Uh, and so I think that's what a lot of it is. It, it's less to do with the subject, and it's more to do with people's egos and personalities. Because yeah. we're all human at the end of the day. So, Unfortunately, that is the world we live in today. <laughs> well, let's take a real quick break. Some commercial messages. We'll be right back in just a minute or two. You're listening to Arkanasa Radio. Do you have skin? Would you like to take better care of it? Call Lourdes James, independent beauty consultant, and set up an appointment. Call 723-3019. If your vision isn't what it used to be, and you're not sure you're seeing Bigfoot or just your neighbor mowing his lawn, stop on by Del Norte Optical. 107 Calle del Norte, just across the street from the Embassy Suites. You should be able to see what you're looking at. Remember, if you're seeking that great cup of coffee, the Organic Man Coffee Shop will be reopening soon. 1002 Eater B Day, Suite Number 7. Life is too short to drink bad coffee. No, don't say goodbye. Stay with us. This is Arcanelza Radio. Quédate con nosotros. Estás escuchando Arcanelza Radio. You're listening to Strange Things with Chris James. Welcome back. We're well, speaking with Nick Redfern again about his book, Men in Black. 
the giant rock that Van Tassel, George Van Tassel, was uh, famous for, or was he famous for the rock, or the rock was famous for him? When it split, did anything actually happen afterwards? Well, I mean, Giant Rock's an interesting area. I've been out there quite a few times over the years, and I wrote a book on the so-called contactee movement, as it's known, um, which Van Tassel was sort of a you know a prime mover of in the early 50s. Um, Giant Rock is just outside Landers, California, um, about an hour or so's drive outside of Palm Springs. So it's out in the desert, you know, definite, definitive def, uh, desert land. And there's this huge rock there, hence the name Giant Rock, and in the early 50s, Van Tassel, who, um, Van Tassel was an interesting guy. I mean, even before, you know, he got involved in the UFO subject, um, he was actually good friends uh, with the legendary Howard Hughes and um, the aviation expert and, um, as I call him in my book, Brilliant Fruitcake. <laughs> and um, he, you know, um, Howard Hughes was sort of one of the most legendary characters of the 20th century. And... Um, uh, George Van Tassel worked with him and was good friends with him. And uh, he often, and Hughes often um, came for dinner with uh, Van Tassel and his wife. Um, but what happened in the early 50s was that um, Van Tassel had these experiences out in the desert at Giant Rock, where he and his wife were living at the time. And he talked about seeing this sort of classic flying saucer land and these very human-looking aliens come out of it with long blonde hair, which... They became known as the Space Brothers, and uh, they were sort of the typical types of alien reported in the 50s, the so-called Space Brothers. And as I said, the people who had these experiences were known as contactees. And the message was generally um, disarm your nukes, uh, live in peace and harmony, you know, or we'll do something about it and intervene. Not unlike the scenario in sort of the, the day the Earth stood still, the movie, except the fact that in the movie you have... Michael Rennie, the actor in sort of slick black hair and, and a suit, you know, whereas the Space Brothers, I said, look more like something straight out of Woodstock in the 60s, you know, sort of, um, sort of like an early sort of hippie movement kind of thing. Um, but Van Tassel developed a massive following, and um, he used to put these yearly conferences on called the Giant Rock Convention. And at their height, they were getting audiences of like 10,000, you know, people would turn up and it would be an outdoor event obviously for that size and people just pull up in the cars bring deck chairs or whatever and um and sit and listen to the le lectures from people like george van tassel george adamski truman betherum who are all amongst the early um contactees and uh as i mentioned in the, my contactees book there's um, an extensive fbi file on george van tassel showing the fbi was very interested in his claims and um and his writings, he had this um, this journal, uh, like a newsletter that he would put out regularly, and um, the FBI f had copies of that as well. So, you know, he was someone who was very much sort of a, fo a big force in ufology, even though a lot of the um, early UFO researchers, you know, they wrote off the contactee movement. And I actually don't, because I do think there's something to it. I don't think it was people hoaxing. I, you know, you can look at the the kind of experiences they had in the desert environments. So you find a lot of deep parallels going throughout history where people met supernatural entities in the desert and found their lives changed and they sort of felt galvanized to become leaders of groups and things. You know, you, know, you can find, you take UFOs out of the equation and find very similar things, as I said, throughout recorded history. The final word in your book, you mentioned the letter from Bender that fell off the wall. Uh, did the oh, letter? Yeah. Did the letter survive? The letter survived, but the picture frame didn't. <laughs> hmm. That was weird. But uh, yeah, that that was a weird thing. I mean, I talk about this um, quite often. When, like I said, when you look into these phenomena, it's as if they get their grips into you. And um, as I mentioned in the the Men in Black book. Um, I was, this is, we're talking about last summer now, you know, because it takes a few months to, a book to go from being the Word documents, obviously, to becoming a finished book. Um, but what happened, it was um, last summer, and I just finished the Word document for the book, I closed it down, I was going to send it to my agent, Lisa, and um, as I closed it down, I heard a bang coming from somewhere in my apartment. It's not a big apartment, so, you know, it didn't take me long to find it. What had happened is that in one of the rooms, um, 
a picture had fallen off the wall and the, the frame had broke and the glass had shattered. Um, and that particular room has a lot of paintings and pictures on the wall, as most of the rooms do as well. But of all the pictures that fell off, at the very time as I closed the Men in Black book document, it was a framed letter that Albert Bender, who kicked off the Men in Black mystery, had written to a colleague and friend back in the early 50s, warning him about the Men in Black. And it was sort of like a weird synchronistic event that led me to think that, you know, this wasn't coincidence. It was almost as if, in some, almost like an ethereal, weird fashion, the Men in Black were watching me as well. And I've had a few experiences like that, based usually based around synchronicities, that lead me to believe, you know, that somehow this phenomenon does know when you sort of look at it. It sort of looks back at you. That was a different experience. Aside from the MIBs, well, yeah, very different. aside from the MIBs, you're also interested in cryptozoology. And how did that come about? Well, um, that actually goes back to when I was about six uh, years old. I went to uh, my parents took me on a week's holiday to Scotland. I spent a day at Loch Ness, mm. and so I, you know, I got to know the story of the Loch Ness monster, and. Um, but I sort of forgot about it then for a couple of years. And uh, and it was when the interesting UFOs reached me, and I was sort of 11 or 12, as we mentioned earlier. Um, as I said, I, I started to read a lot of John Keel's books. And Keel suggested that all these phenomena, whether Bigfoot, lake monsters, UFOs, they all seemed to have... There was there were certain things that interconnected them. And Keel came to believe that in something that he called the cosmic trickster the idea of one form that can perhaps manifest in different ways, but they're all, it's all interconnected, um, even though we don't think it is. So reading things that Keel had written about, like Mothman and Lake Monsters and Bigfoot, then that sort of pushed me down the path of reading about those things. And I guess probably cryptozoology is one of my favorite areas because I enjoy going on sort of expeditions, you know, and looking mm -hmm. for these things and staking out lakes and you know forests and stuff like that and you know hopefully one day we'll catch or at least find evidence of some of these things so you know i, I enjoyed the sort of the road trip angle of those sort of investigations you're not speaking in jefferson this year i see uh will you be making a an appearance there sell some oh books? yeah I'm, I'm having a table there what usually happens is that uh, sorry no i'm giving one lecture there ah. um yeah, but uh, it, it, it probably may not be on the site yet because actually with Craig, the organiser, mm -hmm. uh, we only sort of um, discussed it just very recently, so I will be added to it. Oh, but I'll good. have a table there and I'll be giving a small lecture. But typically what usually happens is that, you know, obviously Craig doesn't just want the same people over and over every year. You want to bring new people in, you know, because the audience wants to see new stuff. So I will actually have um, a table there selling books, etc. Um and, you know, I'll be there for the whole weekend because, again, you know, you learn a lot, but it's a good sort of social mm -hmm. time as well. And uh, I spoke there last year and I think the year before. So uh, it's definitely time to let other people <laughs> have a say as well. So. Now, the first time I ran into you was at the Bigfoot conference when it was in Thailand. Yeah. I was surprised. Yeah, I mean, that was a long time ago. Oh, yes. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. But um, I like, the you know, the, the Bigfoot one because... You know, it, it is a good social scene, and everybody kind of knows everybody after a time, and um, and nobody has any sort of worries about sharing their story or being laughed at because pe most of the people there have either had experiences or they know someone who has. You know, so everybody is again is sort of in it all together, which is a good thing. Oh yes, anything new with the chupacabras? Not really. I mean, I did a book on this last year called. Uh, Chupacabra Road Trip, which sort of um, covered all my on-the-road expeditions around Puerto Rico looking for the original Chupacabra and, of course, around Texas for the Texan equivalent. But um, I think the subject's kind of, well, from my perspective, you know, I don't get anywhere near as many reports as I did, say, a year or two ago. Now, people are still seeing them, but I think the media coverage you know which was really intense for a while here in texas it sort of died off you know and i think the spiraling effect is that when the media doesn't talk about it so much people don't tell them about it so much and when they don't tell them so much the media doesn't cover it so much so it's like a spiraling mm -hmm. thing where you know unless something really big happens it sort of gets pushed to the sidelines again 
we were going to have a live studio audience tonight. We're going to take some questions from the audience, but they weren't able to make it. I did get three questions from one of the would-have-been participants. She wanted me to ask you, have you ever dreamt that ETs were talking to you? Um, I actually haven't, um, but I have had some weird um, dream-like situations where I did kind of feel like um, it was almost like a like a supernatural invasion of your dream, that kind of thing. And that was actually tied in with a, par- a sleep paralysis experience I had in back in 2002. Um, you know, it, it was as if I... Well, it was definitely sleep paralysis, but it felt like something was not just in the room, but it actually invaded my dreams to, and prevented me from, or tried to prevent me from waking up because I think it's only in the dream state that they can kind of get their grips into you. Mm. So I can't say it was an extraterrestrial. It was, you know, it was actually like a cowled, hooded type figure, which I felt coming down um, the corridor. This was when I was living in a little town called Needleland in South Texas. And, um, and I kind of felt this presence of this, hooded figure coming down the corridor I couldn't move I tried and I felt it was sort of trying to get into the dream state and keep me there for whatever reason so that's kind of along those lines but I can't say you know it was an extraterrestrial or or what it was Mm -hmm. you didn't see any outfit with any strange symbols anything like that no it was actually like a dark cloak and (laughs) um with like a cowled head that kind of thing so that's there weren't really any patterns or anything no Ever have any dreams that came true? Oh yeah, um, the what I've had about three. There was nothing particularly spectacular about them, but I think about three dreams over the years, which were sort of prophetic dreams of something that happened, and and it, and it was you know it wasn't anything significant, you know, like a car crash in a specific place or anything. It was just you know, just run-of-the-mill everyday stuff, but it was the context of it and the specifics were right on target. And, you know, it was sort of maybe a year before I had the dream and then something happened. Then I realized, wow, that's this, that what just happened was sort of, you know, exactly like that dream I had. And for some reason, I remembered the dream. So, you know, I think that's important. It wasn't just like, like deja vu, you know, where you think you've done something again previously. It was... I was able to have sort of conscious recall, mm-hmm. you know, of that dream. I would think about it from time to time, and then it was literally as if, you know, it had come true. So, uh, and that, what that tells me is that, you know, when you have a sort of prophetic dream of something that happens in the future, it suggests to me we don't understand the true nature of reality. We don't understand the concept of time as it actually is. You know, I think time as it, as we see it, you know, is obviously as we see it, but... I think sometimes within time itself, um, there can be glitches or or maybe they're just aspects of it we don't understand. If we did, maybe we could manipulate it and alter it. Maybe that's what some of these entities are. Maybe they're, you know, one of the theories of the men in black is that they're time travelers and, um, you know, they come back, you know, essentially to threaten us not to talk about UFOs. Maybe it's something to do you know, with uh, concerns about timelines being altered, you know, that they, mm-hmm. they threaten us for that reason, and we're not seeing the bigger picture. So. Well, do you have any new books that you're working on right now or any new adventures that you're starting out on? Um, well, as I said, I've got the Women in Black book, the paper that comes out in July. The Kindle one's already up there. Then in September, I've got um, actually a book on the Loch Ness Monster, but it deals with a, um, a range of bizarre and weird paranormal uh, data attached to Nessie. Hmm. And I also got that in that same month through Visible Ink Press, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a book called The Monster Book, which is an A to Z of 200 weird creatures. So, you know, you've got like B for Bigfoot and N for Nessie, but then there's, so there's about 20 or 30 of well-known ones, but then there's about 170 ones that, you know, people I think will find really interesting, but they're sort of very largely unknown, you know, regional ones of very strange creatures across the U.S. and the rest of the world. Well, this has been an absolutely fascinating hour. I wish it didn't have to shut it down, but our time has come and gone. i really like to thank you for participating tonight. And I look Well, forward- I appreciate you having me on the show, Chris. I had a good time. 
I look forward to seeing you in Jefferson. I'll bring my copy of Men in Black and get you to sign it. Yeah, I'll be pleased to do that for you. All righty, and I'll be speaking to you again shortly. Thank you, sir. All right, thanks a lot, Chris. Thanks. Bye-bye. That was Nick Redfern, author of The Men in Black, and his other book, which is coming out shortly, Women in Black. If you'd like to get a copy, go to Amazon.com. If you'd like to have it signed by the author, join us in Jefferson, Texas, October 15th for the Texas Bigfoot Research Society's or Center's convention. This has been Strange Things with Chris James. Hope you all have enjoyed tonight's show. We'll be back next week with another episode. So until then, see you all later. You're listening to Arkanasa Radio. Are you, are you coming to the tree with a strong upper man? The same murder three. Strange things that I've been hearing, a stranger would it be if we met at midnight in the hanging tree.